Good evening, everyone. I'm Erica Resnick, Assistant Director of the Temple Emanuel Stryker Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the special evening of remembrance for a woman we were proud to call one of our own and proud to have welcomed to the Stryker Center nearly five years ago. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg once told a reporter that after her death, she hoped to be remembered as someone who helped repair tears in society, someone who made things a little better through the use of whatever limited abilities she had. Following her passing last September, her dear friend Nina Totenberg put it best when she wrote that it was appropriate that Justice Ginsburg had died as the sun set on the Jewish year 5780, since Jewish teachings suggest that those who died just before the new year are the ones God held back until the very last moment because they are the most needed and the most righteous. Needed and righteous, that pretty much sums up Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Tonight, we are excited to welcome Jeffrey Rosen to talk about the immense needs Justice Ginsburg filled and the righteousness of her life, which Rosen witnessed not only as a legal journalist and scholar, but as a friend of more than 25 years after they met by chance in an elevator. President of the National Constitution Center, Jeffrey is author of Conversations with RBG, and we are proud that he joins us to speak about a true Aisha Kyle, a woman of valor, our heroine, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Jeffrey will be in conversation with Dahlia Lithwick, contributing editor at Newsweek and senior editor at Slate. If you have questions for them, please post them through the, through the Zoom chat and we'll get to as many as we can. You will also have the opportunity to purchase Jeffrey's book if you haven't already through a link that we'll post in the chat. Before our conversation begins, we wanna take a moment to allow you to think about Justice Ginsburg's journey from the streets of Brooklyn to a seat at the highest court in the land. The barriers she had to overcome and the barriers she removed for so many of us. These themes are captured in the song, As If I Weren't There. And tonight it will be sung by Lori Akers, host of Jewish Rock Radio Live Across America, Chicago Sings, and cantorial soloist at Congregation Or Shalom in Illinois. I hope you enjoy the program. Okay, they prayed without me as if. 
Thank you so, so much. That was, that was glorious. And it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, Jeff, it's good to see you. I'm remembering that the last time we did one of these conversations, it was right after RBG had died. And I remember you and I both got choked up at the end. Uh, it's really hard to hear a song like that. It's wonderful to see you, Dolly, and I'm already in tears. Um, that was such a beautiful song, and as it happens, the music by Laurie Akers was so beautiful, and I see that those gorgeous lyrics were written by Abigail Pogerman, who I went to high school with, and Abigail, if you're watching, uh, that was you so gorgeously captured the, the spirit of RBG, her bond with her mother, and that notion that she would never consent to being treated as if she weren't there, always in her strong voice asserting her vision of justice, which she got from her mom. So, wow, what a, what a great beginning. And Dali, I, I, before we started, I said all of our conversations feel like shivas. So I think this one has started um, in very much in that spirit. Well, in that spirit, I think I want to open just by asking, and I should just say welcome to uh, the many, many of you who are joining us. And I think Jeff and I both wish we could be doing this in person and knock wood, it'll happen soon. And thank you to the Stryker Center for hosting this event. And thanks to Jeff for his gorgeous book, uh, which is bringing us together tonight. Uh, my table setting question is just this, a little bit of, of time has passed since September, since we last reckoned with uh, the loss of RBG. And I wonder if there's any way in which you feel that the conversation around her, about her, her legacy, the iconography, the hagiography has changed, has gotten thin, has gotten thick, has gone off the rails. Is there anything that you've seen in the months since her passing uh, that in any way changes the way you thought about RBG for the 20 years that you knew her in real life? Um, I'll, I'll ask you the same question after I, I answer it, um, which is to say, I, I haven't paid close attention to the social media and to, to shifting perceptions, or if, if there's a thread, I, I've missed it, but I find in the many conversations I've had since she passed, each one ends up being a spiritual experience because for me and for most of the people who are remembering her, she was so much more than just one of the most important justices in American history. She was so much more than just one of the most important advocates for uh, women's equality in American history. Daye knew that would have been enough. In addition, she, she's, a, she's a spiritual force. She's an inspiration about how to live. And her shining example seems all the more relevant at whatever moment we're in. And then there's always an anxious moment and you always think it couldn't be more vexed. She provides strength and light and ballast and a woman of valor. What a great uh, phrase in, in the introduction. Such a, such a woman of valor, courage, temperance, prudence, all of the classical virtues and all of the Jewish virtues. And I find her 
legacy more inspiring and relevant than ever. But how about you? You know, it's interesting because I, I was obviously reflecting on this when I was writing my questions today, and I thought a version of the same thing, which is that there's just a big RBG-shaped hole in the world, and that I'm really aware, and I know you and I have talked over the past years about how could this tiny, you know, octogenarian who was a, a, the wonkiest of wonks who sat on this court that we never saw in action, how could she have informed every part of not just American thinking, but I think feminist thinking around the world. And you really see it now in its absence. I, I, I just think nothing has rushed in to fill the vacuum and the void. And you're right, it's spiritual. I think that right or wrong, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the misnomers about how we thought about her, but whether that hagiography was correct or not descriptively, we're lost. I think people feel at sea. I, I think that puts it so well. And it must be because the Jewish tradition and all the wisdom and traditions are correct that there, there are very few men or women of valor, the, the tzaddik, the, the great prophet, the, the wisest women and men are you know come to us once or twice in a in a generation they're, they're rare and we were privileged to know i mean just to think to have been able to have the privilege of learning from such a person is incredible so our job tonight not is not to get all uh, choked up too early but just to try to convey to our friends what it was that made her such a Sadek, a woman of valor, what, what, how, how, how she was able to uh, provide us with such a shining example of how to live. So that's perfect. That's a perfect segue to the substantive thing I want to start with tonight, Jeff, which is the dissent. Because one of the things that becomes truly pathbreaking about RBG. And, and we can talk about how her voice changed and she became quite a different jurist and thinker and writer when she began to dissent. Uh, but I want to talk by rooting it a little bit in what I think is a really deep centuries old Jewish tradition of dissent uh, that, you know, the rabbis, if you study Gemara, they're always very open about putting pen to paper and saying you're wrong. And I want to just bracket that by saying there was a real question at the U.S. Supreme Court at the founding about whether dissents were even appropriate. It took a while to get comfortable with the idea that the court was not going to speak as this oracular uh, entity. RBG, I think, in some sense, uses dissent the way the rabbis do. It's a letter to the future. It's a way of saying, I get it, I lost, but here's a thing that the young people need to know. A am I right? And, and more pointedly, is that the way she thought about dissent when she talked about it with you? What a great question. And yes, you are right. And your basic insight was the Supreme Court originally wasn't Jewish enough. <laughs> it, it's true that the court under John Marshall and, and John Roberts has cited this as an ideal, uh, was often unanimous and Marshall discouraged separate opinions. He thought that it undermined the legitimacy of the court. He wanted the court to speak in one voice, namely his own. And that drove his arch rival Thomas Jefferson crazy. He would criticize the court under Marshall as a group of sappers and miners who were hiding behind the cloak of unanimity to conceal their uh, agendas. Um, RBG became the most uh, powerful dissenting voice of her generation on the court. And it's absolutely rooted in the Talmudic tradition. RBG herself uh, um, invoked as one of her heroes, Justice Louis Brandeis. Um, Brandeis was known as Isaiah. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt and others called him Isaiah because he looked like a prophet and he also would prophesy. And he, one of his favorite prophecies was from the book of Isaiah, come let us reason together. And Brandeis, like RBG, believed in the institutional legitimacy of the court. Generally, you know, he, he could be a team player, but his most shining, unforgettable letters to the future 
are his separate opinions and Whitney versus California, the free speech opinion. And friends who are watching, as Sally and I talk, ch check out the opinions that we're talking about after the show, not now, because they're all worth reading. So Brandeis and Whitney, RBG cites that as an example, or his dissenting opinion in the Olmstead case involving Fourth Amendment privacy. RBG, as, and, uh, as, as you note, uh, wasn't originally thought of as a fiery voice of dissent uh, on the Court of Appeals and in her first years on the Supreme Court, she was the judge's judge. She was the judge who Chief Justice John Roberts told me in our early interview in 2007, he thought was most likely to be on board with his philosophy of narrow unanimous opinions because she was so collegial and, and remained so. But she fiercely was attached to defending her views. And when she thought something was wrong, she would say so. She would not, she would be heard, um, as the song uh, suggests. So I, I, I think she absolutely um, embraced that role. And it allowed her to combine the crusading passion that she showed as an advocate with the master strategy uh, that she deployed on the court. And she could only do it when she was senior associate justice responsible for writing the major dissents or assigning them to the judge she thought would best reflect her views. She thought it was part of her role. And once emboldened, she became one of the most important dissenters of our time. And it's no accident, right, that when she becomes the notorious RVG, right? The gangsta, you know, rap with the crown. All that happens based on her descents in Hobby Lobby, in Shelby County. Once she starts, and I think you've nailed it, really speaking in her own voice, speaking from a place that is not necessarily the consensus builder, the minimalist, the get along person, but a place of kind of anger. And she stops quoting other people and writing as herself. That's kind of when America looks around and goes, who is this 70 something year old woman? And how can I be more like her? So the sense become an embodiment of when we begin to reckon with her as a real voice. I agree with every word of that. The only word I want to talk about is the word anger, because as, as we've discussed, anger was the one emotion that her mother most advised her to avoid. And RBG would often quote her mother's advice, advice, avoid unproductive emotions like anger, jealousy, or remorse. They are not productive and they will distract you from uh, productive work. And this is the advice of the Talmud, uh, when it uh, both instructs us to love our neighbor, uh, and it's the advice of all the great wisdom traditions, including the Greek and Roman philosophers. Aristotle says our central goal is to overcome unproductive passions like anger and jealousy and vice and boastfulness so that we can achieve the virtues of temperance, prudence, and justice. So I think that, you know, I never actually asked her, did her mom, where did her mom get it from the Talmud or from Aristotle? It could have been either. But what she was embodying was the virtue of justice. And it was a controlled indignation, a, 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 a restrained passion, a, a, a quietly burning flame that, that burned for justice, not, not out of anger, because she was always restrained, always controlled, always setting aside her own ego-based emotions so that she could serve the light and serve others. Uh, and, um, and that's why her dissents are so... It was so, or so particular. There's, there's so much in her voice because, as we know, her, her, her writing style was very particular. Um, she would choose every word carefully. It's not a, a crusading kind of uh, style. Um, uh, she, her, her teacher in at Cornell was 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 Nabokov, uh, and Nabokov taught her to think about every word. She often told us. When asked why she would have these long pauses between a question and answer, I like to think before I speak. So you never would have guessed from her majority opinions or opinions on the Court of Appeals, which always quoted other authority and were always careful to build on previous foundations and, and never took credit for ideas because she was so careful to attribute to others and say that she stood on their shoulders. You wouldn't have thought that she would be the notorious RBG, but suddenly she feels emboldened to become so, and she's 
these unbelievable lines. You don't just because you're not getting wet in a rainstorm doesn't mean you throw away the umbrella. Not written to catch headlines, but because it's just the perfect image. It's the kind of stuff that would come up at oral argument when she said that um, a separate but equal um, non-full marriage equality was like a skim milk marriage. You know, she would write as she thought. So that's why it's so, you can always, I'm, uh, uh, Amanda Tyler has just published um, the final collection of RBG's bench opinions and her a couple of unpublished speeches. And, and it's so wonderful to have more of RBG because each word of hers is precious and just to hear her voice and to have more of her particular specific words, knowing that she just chose every single one in that beautiful pencil, which she would use to edit all of every single word that went out in her name is so meaningful. So we've touched on one of the, I think, mismatches between the popular conception of RBG as a character that came from a place of anger or outrage. Because I agree, I think that doesn't map on to the RBG that you and I um, you know, have covered and known. The other mismatch I want to talk about before we move on to the cases is the notion that her feminist was a zero sum, her feminist view of the world was a kind of zero sum feminism that, you know, and famously everybody likes to quote when she was asked how many women would be ideal on the Supreme Court, she would famously say nine, um, but she didn't think of women's victories and triumphs, particularly under the law, as something that men should suffer for or from. And she was a real stickler, as you say, for giving credit to her male allies, to the men who lifted her up. I interviewed her very, very shortly before the court locked down in COVID, asked her about Erwin Griswold, the famous story where he pulled those 10 women in her 1L class aside and made them explain why they were taking a spot from a woman. And I said, wasn't that offensive? And she was like, no, I think he was really joking and we missed it. You know, this is a story that's everybody's told the story. She used to tell the story as an affront. And she had gotten to the place where she was like, he was so good, so central to getting women admitted to Harvard. I think he was joking. And I, I want to ask you about the ways in which we again get her wrong when we suggest that her feminism meant that men had to stand down. Because I think in so many ways, and I know you and I have talked about this, she fell in love with some of the men whose cases she brought. The early cases when she was bringing uh, actions on behalf of men at the ACLU Women's Rights Project. It wasn't a trick that she was going to trick the court into saying, you know, oh, wait, laws that discriminate on the basis of sex disadvantage women. She genuinely believed in this amazing, capacious way that men would benefit if they were allowed to stay home and take care of their ailing mothers, stay home and take care of their children. She was a really radical feminist insofar as she thought men would benefit from feminism too, right? Oh, so you put it so well. That's exactly right. And we did. We did benefit from her, her feminism. She taught us so much, men and women. The, the first case that she um, argued uh, it encapsulated it, it all. It's the basis for the movie On the Basis of Sex. So many of our friends will, will know it. Um, Amanda Tyler's book, Prince the Brief, which I hadn't read uh, before, um, in the Moritz case, and it's a perfect case because um, so she and her beloved husband, Marty, are sitting at home in the room, in their separate rooms. And as she would always um, say, Riley, his room was bigger. So he's in the big room and she's in the small room and they're working. And he, she's at the ACLU and he comes running in the room and says, you've got to take this case. It's a, ta a tax case. Why would I want it to a tax case? Because it's this guy, Charles Moritz, who's unable to get a benefit to care for his ailing mother because he never married. If he had been a, a widow, uh, he could have gotten the benefit. If he'd got been a woman, uh, he could have gotten the benefit. If he'd been a bad, um, if, he, if he'd been divorced, he could have gotten the benefit. But um, uh, unmarried men couldn't get it. And Marty said that just isn't fair. It makes no sense. Uh, she agreed. Moritz's brief, which he wrote himself, was something like 
it's not fair that I shouldn't get this because I never got married. It's just you couldn't express the justice more precisely. Then you read um, Ruth and Marty Ginsburg's brief, and I could hear Marty's voice in a couple places. He was incredibly funny, as you know. Um, being with him was like drinking champagne. Uh, he would make her crack up. They were so in love until the very end, and, and she would she would just double over laughing at his jokes, which included when he was walking past the Capitol, he told his grandkids that the statue on the top of the Capitol was him. It was that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, in, in the brief, he says something like, you know, uh, if he'd been a, a, a divorcee or um, engaged in some other matrimonial adventure, he could have gotten the benefit, but, you know, uh, he couldn't because he was single. So, they win that case and they do it together. And she gives and she wants in her last book, she wants to give Marty credit for his role in writing the brief because she's so particular about never taking all the credit herself. And then, as you say, she goes on to represent uh, the, in the Weisenfeld case, the Stephen Weisenfeld, who can't get a federal benefit uh, because he is wants to care for his uh, child, Matthew. And if he'd been a woman, he could have gotten the benefit and lots of other men. And she did it both strategically because she thought that the mostly male, uh, almost entirely chauvinistic and sexist judges of her time would be more likely to empathize with men. And also because she thought it wasn't fair because her vision of justice was not, was just, was, was that men were and women were entitled to the same Opportunities, as she said over and over again, generalizations about the way men or women are cannot guide me reliable in making decisions about particular individuals, that which encapsulated her equal treatment philosophy. And that's also why, as you say, she insisted that men and women would not be truly equal until men took equal responsibility for child care, which is so prescient. You know, we, we now, it was about five decades ahead of its time, but we, we now know how, how true that is. So all of that is exactly right. And it is a radical view of feminism, of uh, radical in the sense of not, be, uh, it's it's not maybe perhaps widely shared today, but it, may, it may have great resonance, but it's it was uniquely her own and it's incredibly persuasive and it's rooted in the Declaration of Independence. It's so important, she would often cite uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others who at the Seneca Falls in their Declaration of Sentiment insisted that all men and women are created equal. And it was important to Im extend the promise of the Declaration to men and women so that it could embrace previously excluded groups, not only women, but also immigrants, LGBTQ people, um, min minorities and others. So it was a very American view. It was very clear home and it was superb. Dahlia, before you, we, you ask me about the cases, I want to switch and ask you about something very, um, which I'm so excited to share with our friends. So uh, friends who are watching, um, Dahlia has authorized me to share that she has uh, just agreed to write a biography of RBG for the Yale Jewish Live series. And I am so thrilled about this. I had the honor of writing the volume about uh, Justice Brandeis and the editor of the Yale Jewish Live series. And I and everyone else who thought about it could not imagine anyone better to uh, capture the shining spirit of RBG than Dahlia. So we were thrilled when she said that she would try to make time for this. And my question, I understand that you may not be able to, you know, uh, get to it immediately is, there, there, there is. There's been a lot of RBG books, uh, including mine. There's a, a at least one really good, substantial biography of RBG by uh, Jane uh, DeHart. Uh, the Jewish Lives books are not comprehensive, 500-page uh, biographies, but uh, intellectual portraits that capture the spirit of whatever aspect of RBG you want to capture. So my question is, what aspects of RBG do you want to capture? Um, well, thank you for that. I actually, and the truth is, I just want folks to know I'm going to finish a big book for Penguin Press. So I'm, I'm a little, um, it's the timeline is longer than I might um, want it to be. Uh, but I have been thinking a lot about the ways in which her Judaism inflected on the way Justice Ginsburg thought. And, you know, I think there's a set of 
obvious answers that she would always give. You know, she would always talk about tikkun olam. It was really important to her. She would talk about tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. So there were these Jewish notions, I think, that shot through everything, absolutely everything, the way she talked about the world. I think one of the things that I've been really struck by in trying to connect up her jurisprudence to her way of thinking about her Jewishness, Jeff, is the ways in which she was so deeply solicitous of outsiders. I think that, and this also, you know, you can track it back to Justice Frankfurter and Brandeis. I think it is a really fascinating Jewish quality to the extent that you can define one on the court that allows you to empathize with outsiders, even if you did not have their experience at all. And so one of the things that I have really marked in RBG's writing is her ability to talk about the women greeters at Walmart who are being harassed by their bosses. And you're like, she was never a woman greeter at Walmart. Her ability to talk about minority voters in the South trying to, to vote in Shelby County. And I think that it's always amazing to me, and I think you and I have talked about this, she was in some sense deeply controlled. She was very conventional. She was very much a product of a sort of middle class and then eventually upper middle class, uh, very academic intellectual life. And yet her moral imagination and its ability to capture the life of people who are shut out of the American dream, I think is really profound. Mm. And I think maybe I'm wrong, you'll tell me some of that is really deeply, deeply um, bound up with her capacity to see that outsiders in America are struggling and suffering. They're vulnerable. They're not being protected by the law. And I think she thought about her parents when she thought about that. She thought about as a child driving around, seeing signs that said, no Jews, no dogs, what that meant to her. So am I right in saying that at least part of it you know, certainly she lived discrimination against women every day of her life. But I think the ability to capture in writing what it is like to be discriminated against, even if she wasn't a member of the community that experienced it, felt to me like it was really bound up with how she thought about herself as a Jew. Wow. I'm just blown away. I cannot wait to read your book. And I think that those are such important themes to discuss. So I think you're absolutely right. It was her moral imagination, her empathy that was so distinctive. And um, there's no doubt that it was partly rooted in her background. She talked about, as uh, other uh, Jews of her generation did, including my parents, uh, who were, my mom was born the same year she was, uh, also in Brooklyn, 1933. Um, they their relatives fled uh, Ukraine in, in uh, uh, my mom's case and, and Eastern Europe and in RBGs and could, would talk about seeing the heads of Jews on sticks. That's not RBG's case, but that was my aunt Ida. So that was their experience. They remembered literally fleeing the pogroms and that experience, which RBG has talked about, undoubtedly created in her a passion for fighting uh, uh, discrimination. The, the, the question is, um, she developed that moral imagination and empathy to an extraordinary degree, unmatched by almost anyone else, you know, of our time. So, so where did that come from? And I'd love you to explore more because I don't know the answer. Do you know to what degree she was deeply um, committed to the Jewish tradition? But to what degree was were the Jewish values uh, part of her self conception? Uh, and where did it come from other places? The, the other um, central experience that she cites in firing her interest in defending the rights of the oppressed was her class with Robert Cushman at Cornell. Uh, who, um, who, and he had her do a research project on the McCarthy hearings while they were taking place. And that experience of seeing um, Jews and other Americans who, although she did cite the Jewish Americans who were uh, suppressed for their speech and their views and per persecuted and discriminated against her was really central. Um, I asked her, as you know, because we've talked about it in our last interview, where did that sense of empathy come from? Because she 
gave it. She talked about her mother's advice. And I, I said, you know, but yes, but you were able to achieve this empathy to such an extraordinary degree, more than almost anyone else. Where did it come from? And she paused for a long time. And she said, you know, right when I was very young, when I was uh, around two years old, my older sister died of meningitis. There was no sulfa drug. And although I was very young, uh, seeing the effect on my parents and seeing their grief made me want to alleviate their pain a little bit and do what I could to make them feel better and then to make the world a better place. And I, I, my sense is that she hadn't thought about it before. I think it was the first time she'd given that answer. So that was something. But there's so much more for you to learn about exactly where that came from. And I cannot wait to read the book. Well, let's talk about your book a little bit, Jeff, because um, you just pointedly asked her questions that a lot of us reporters were afraid to ask her. Um, and one of the questions that I think is really probably salient for people who are watching and listening and tuning in tonight is you asked her about the future of Roe v. Wade. And among, you know, the many issues we could talk about tonight, you know, voting rights and uh, uh, First Amendment rights and all the issues, you know, the clash between uh, uh, religious dissenters and civil rights. There's a lot of things I think we can talk about in terms of what she would be worried about on the current court today. But it seems to me that top of mind for her would have had to be Roe and the future of women's re reproductive rights. And there's a case that the key court keeps holding over but not um, deciding to take that would challenge that directly. One of her answers to you, I want to press you on this. When you asked her about how sanguine she was, she said she was okay because she trusted that John Roberts would effectively do with Roe what the Chief Justice, who she was very, very fond of, um, uh, Rehnquist, did with the Miranda case, which is at the end of the day, the rubber hit the road. He had the chance to reverse it. And he saw his role as chief as doing something institutional, which was not willy nilly reversing cases. And that seems to be her answer to you about Roe. I have confidence that John Roberts is going to stand up for precedent and stand up for a decades long precedent. And one of the things obviously that's changed is John Roberts doesn't get to make that call. Uh, it's out of his hands. And I wonder if you have some sense of how alarmed she would be about the fact that we may have a 5-4-6-3 majority, not just to overturn Roe. I think, you know, uh, Amy Coney Barrett wasn't willing to say Griswold versus Connecticut was precedent of the court. To, is there some sense, do you think, that her assurance that John Roberts was going to hold the line on women's rights is kind of obviated by what's happened since? Yes, there is. No doubt about it. She told her granddaughter that her most fervent wish on her deathbed, her most fervent wish was that she be replaced after the presidential election. She knew exactly what she was saying. And there's no doubt she uh, believed, as you said, that the whole five to four balance hung on John Roberts being the swing boat, that if he were replaced, uh, if she were re replaced or if the balance of the court changed, then uh, the cases that she cared so deeply about, including Roe, might indeed be imperiled. And that means they are indeed imperiled. Now, on Roe, she always emphasized that the main effect of overturning Roe would be on poor women who don't have access to abortion. Uh, it would be even harder after Roe were overturned, states where there was only one uh, clinic now and women had to travel across the entire state would now have none. Uh, women, women of means, she emphasized, could always easily travel to another state like New York or California or you know many places and uh, exercise their, their right to choose. So she, she did instruct us not to, she, she, she always reminded everyone of the basic fact, if Roe is overturned, it doesn't mean that abortion becomes illegal everywhere. It means that each state is free to either protect or ban abortion as it chooses. So the states that currently protect reproductive choice would protect them just as vigorously as ever. And those that are trying to 
restrict it a lot, would restrict it even more and, and maybe ban it entirely. So she, for her, it was an equity question for poor women. And she and she urged women, including her granddaughter, who was fighting for these questions, to emphasize on expanding the access of poor women to abortions, even if Roe were overturned. Now, whether Roe will be overturned cleanly in one swoop or whether it'll be chipped away so that it effectively uh, doesn't protect uh, the right to early term abortions, who knows, you know, that there may be some negotiation on the court along those lines. But when Justice Sotomayor quoted Justice Ginsburg's recent dissent in, in a recent abortion case involving abortion access, that was quite appropriate because that was Justice Ginsburg's main, main concern. And and yes, there are many other cases, including uh, most notably affirmative action, where the balance was held by either uh, uh, by Roberts or, or by Kennedy, and uh, those might go the other way. Jeff, I want to give you a, a chance to talk about Me Too, because it was one of the issues I know you talked about with her. She said some controversial things about it. Um, I, I think we're in a moment, you know, you can look around and you can see Andrew Cuomo and you can see, you know, in some sense, the country continuing uh, to try to reconcile how to think about this movement, how to, you know, Michelle Goldberg had a, a piece recently in the Times saying maybe Me Too is over. I, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what her sense was of the Me Too movement, what her reservations were, and how much what we've seen since you last talked about this with her has been very much, it seems to me, predicted by some of the things she said to you. She was prescient on this, as in all things. Uh, she did tell me and others her own Me, tells, me Too story at Cornell, where she was uh, hit on by a teaching assistant and she, uh, what did you do? We, we would ask her, I told him, this is not right. And you will not do this at all. You know, with that total self-possession, she just, uh, shut him down and, uh, she was, um, and she advised all women to do the same thing. Um, she was very supportive of the, uh, salutary effects of me too in sensitizing men as well as women about the effects of degrading uh, and uh, behavior as well as unconscious bias. And when I asked her whether men could become more enlightened, she said, well, what do you think? You're a man. And I said, you're much wiser. <laughs> what do you think? And she said, yes, if when, and especially if men uh, treat um, all women as they want their daughters to be treated, then um, we will live in a, a, a more just uh, society. She did, in interviews with me and others, ex also express concern for the due process rights of men. And this is where she was prescient. You know, she was a civil libertarian at her core. And she said that uh, it's important to have both a voice for uh, the accusers and uh, due process for the accused. And she insisted on that. She shared that view with Margaret Atwood, who she I had the unbelievable experience of watching her uh, have a discussion with the Glimmer Glass uh, Opera Festival. Um, she, in an interview with me, and it's, of course, as you know, Dahlia, she went back and edited each page of the transcripts of our interviews and in her perfect pencil marks would change individual words in ways that I didn't even appreciate until they were published. And a reporter noticed that she essentially through her post editorial changes made clear that she thought that the non-disclosure agreements that many women were forced to sign um, that made the pursuit of Me Too cases impossible were um, unconscionable and should not be upheld by the courts. It was a very strong view that an unconscionable contract should not be upheld. And she thought quite closely about it and wanted to call that out. So I think for her, with her extraordinary sense of balance and justice and temperance, that it's possible to achieve respect for women, respect for procedural fairness and a legal system that, as well as a system of social enforcement that fairly adjudicates claims, not automatically believing one side or the other before the, a, a process has taken place, 
but absolutely being open to all examples of uh, harassing and unwelcome behavior. So she's a model here as in so many areas. Jeff, I'm gonna start um, asking you questions that are coming up from our audience. And one of them dovetails with a question I was gonna ask you, which is one of the enduring things we need to struggle with when we talk about RBG and her legacy is her refusal to step down under Obama. There was immense pressure on her. I know you and I have been round and round on this, and I know that it was one of the things I was asked most often in interviews uh, in the days after her death. Uh, So we've got questions from people who say, you know, how do you reckon with that? What do you do with that? And I might add my gloss because this week we're seeing real immense pressure on Justice Breyer um, Mm -hmm. in the media and particularly uh, progressive media around the court that Justice Breyer needs to retire, not today, but yesterday, last Mm -hmm. week. Um, So we're seeing it really amplified now in pressure directed at Justice Breyer. So maybe answer part A first, which is tell folks who are very, very dispirited about that decision, how you think about it, and then maybe with a little cherry on top about what you would tell Justice Breyer in the face of the same pressure this week. She almost made it. She she, she, she was trying so hard to hold on. And she almost made it until after the election. With every ounce that she had, she was trying. Look, who who of us is perfect? Who can time our passing? Her explanation for why she chose not to step down was at the time people were calling for me to step down, who more liberal than I could have been confirmed? And many of the times that she said that, it made sense because it either was a Republican Senate who it became clear certainly by the time of Merrick Garland, you know, wouldn't have confirmed anyone. Now, if she'd stepped down a year before Merrick Garland, I forgot the timing. You know, if the Senate was a Republican, who knows? It's possible they wouldn't have confirmed anyone there. There was a a window when President Obama was in the White House and the Democrats had both houses, or or at least the Senate, that she could have stepped down. And there were some people who were calling on her to step down then. And if she'd stepped down then, she would have been replaced by a Democrat. But she wasn't ready to step down then because she was feeling that she was at in her full powers. And it, as it turned out, she had, um, uh, you know, many years more, more almost 20, 20, uh, seven or eight years more. So if she, if she'd been a, a, a to- had total uh, power of uh, prophecy, she did in many respects, but not unfortunately with regard to her own mortality as none of us do, she might've been strategic and stepped down in 2013. She wasn't ready to, after that, things became very complicated. And I, oh, I, I would just say to anyone who criticizes her just she almost made it she really tried as for justice Breyer, um you did a great interview with him dahlia um it was like some wild some wonderful series of uh, 70 over 70 or something of, of older uh, uh americans and i i'll ask you what he told you because i, I uh, it, that's the most relevant thing um he's he, he's got at least until june so the question of whether he has to step down right now or in june uh, let's let's leave it up to him, but I, he's very savvy about this. So what did, what did he tell you? Uh, he, needless to say, when I interviewed him, uh, for Slate's 80 over 80, by the 80 way, over, um, yeah. uh, he would not answer this question. No, and, uh, no surprises there. Uh, he did tell us what he was doing in COVID. He was locked down with his grandchildren and said they were watching MASH. Uh, match. And he said um, it held up well. It was a very fun interview. He was in a very um, goofy mood. Um, I, I will say one thing about what he said me lashed back to what you just said about Justice Ginsburg. They were both people who care deeply. They both are institutionalists, as you said, they love the court. The worst thing you can do to an institutionalist is politicize the court. So as soon as you tell, I think um, Noah Feldman made this point this week and on the Breyer thing, as soon as you start saying Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg, this is 
absolutely 100% a political decision that has only political valences. That's the only way to look at it. You are guaranteeing that you are going to get their backs up. You are going to put them in a position where they do something that looks partisan and political. And in some sense, my answer on what RBG should have done is also deeply connected, Jeff, to the fact that she always said elections matter. And she always really said, if you all want, you know, the next president to appoint my replacement, get out and vote based on the court. And that was her view. It wasn't a sort of entirely grandiose, nobody could ever replace me. It was, this is not in my hands. It's in your hands as much as in mine. And we know from the 2016 elections that by a two to one margin, people who cared about the court voted for Trump, who said they cared about the court. So I think in some sense, as disappointed as folks are in her, I think she might have been just as disappointed that looking at an election with three octogenarians in a vacancy, America sort of, at least on the progressive side, said, yeah, you know, <laughs> Don't love Hillary. So I, I, I'm not sort of blame shifting here, but I am saying both she and Breyer, in some sense, very, very deeply believe that it's in the hands of the American people <laughs> to decide these things. Uh, it's not entirely on them. So that's my slightly, slightly deflective um thought on that. We we do have questions, Jeff, uh, in the chat about, and I know you've written about this, and I know it's in your book, about this improbable relationship between Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia. And it's really complicated because she was the first to say, and this is in your book too, he was super mean in writing to Sandra Day O'Connor. He could be very caustic, very dismissive. I think there's reason to believe other lawyers kind of modulated their tone to be a little more caustic and dismissive because he made it cool again. And yet, despite, you know, the one thing we've said over and over is she was such a gracious person. She never punched down. She never belittled people. What was at the core of that friendship? It's wonderful that people are so curious about it. And it's, uh, it's, it's, un, it's striking that everyone's so surprised by it. How could two people who disagreed uh, politically and jurisprudentially be such good friends? They were good friends because they bonded over the things that matter in life. They bonded over the same thing that I probably bonded with her over, which was a love of opera. And they would go to shows together and they appeared in operas and he would sing at the piano when they had New Year's together. And he called it the really famous three tenors. Um, he, She said, he drives me crazy, but I, he makes me laugh so hard. I mean, she just, he made her crack up. Um, he was extremely gregarious and uh, uh, a bullion and he, they loved her for it. He, they loved each other for that. And as a result, she was able to disagree so fiercely with him. And it's, you can't understate the degree of their jurisprudential disagreement, but remain friends. And the pretty striking story that she told at, at Justice Scalia's funeral was um, after Bush v. Gore, a decision she abhorred. She, I mean, she deplored it. I, I wrote the um, angriest, although that's not an RBG-like uh, virtue uh, piece I've ever written in my life after Bush v. Gore called Disgrace. And she sent it back after we talked about how upset she was about the decision, you know, signed on the cover of the New Republic with a flourish because she agreed that it was a complete disgrace. Um, but after the decision, she was sitting in her chamber and she said the phone rang and it was Scalia. And he said, Ruth, what are you still doing there? It, this has been an incredible day. Go home and take a hot bath. She said advice that I promptly followed. And they also were united by their love of the court as an institution. And that's why she loved the opera Scalia Ginsburg, which imagined them trapped on a desert island. And the only way they could escape was by arriving at a common jurisprudential philosophy. And her favorite aria was, we are many, we are one, united by our shared devotion to the Constitution. And, it, you know, you can say it's hokey or unrealistic or an atavism of another time, but it was deeply real to them. They were united by a shared devotion to the court and the Constitution. And they also realized that there are many there are things in life that are much more important than political or even jurisprudential disagreement. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can deeply respect someone else's uh, intellect and integrity 
while still strongly rejecting their views. So they live that. And that's why it's important for us to remember that. It, it's, de it's urgently important, really. It's urgently important because we are at a precarious time for the court and the country. And for the reasons we've been discussing, we run the risk both of extraordinarily polarized six to three decisions that overturn much of the, many of the decisions that RBG cared uh, deeply about. And there's talk of court packing in the air. And there are many uh, progressives who view the court as illegitimate because of failure to fill seats and the way that other seats were filled and so forth. And RBG, at least before her passing, uh, rejected court packing. She said she wasn't for it because she thought it would hurt the court as an institution. I mean, how she, I, how she would feel about it in light of her passing, I, I'm, I won't presume to speculate, but because uh, I don't know. But I do know that she really thought that the it was urgently important for the country to preserve some kind of nonpartisan faith in the court as an upholder of the rule of law that transcended politics. So that's why we should remember her friendship with Justice Scalia and try to emulate it. I'm so glad you mentioned it, Jeff, because I've been thinking that she would be horrified, I imagine, by the optics of members of the House right now refusing to talk to each other, moving their offices around, uh, not you know even looking each other in the eye and bracketing even why that has happened. Certainly some of it, um, I imagine is, you know, you can say is plausible and justifiable given the rancor, but just how horrible as an institutionalist, she would find the idea that individual animus is getting in the way of people doing their jobs. Because I just think that no matter what happened, and we saw it with Brett Kavanaugh as well, uh, she was quick to welcome him to the court and quick to say, you know, plot it's to him. He hires a lot of women clerks and that matters. She was not willing to tear down institutions over partisanship. I'm going to put in a plug now for a learning platform that she was a big supporter of and that you know as well, Dahlia. And that's the National Constitution Center's interactive constitution. It's this amazing online platform that's gotten almost 45 million hits. It's the most Googled constitution. If you Google any amendment, we come up top. And the idea is to follow RBG and Justice Scalia's example and to bring together liberal and conservative scholars nominated by the conservative Federalist Society and the Progressive American Constitution Society to write about every clause of the Constitution describing areas of agreement and disagreement. And in addition to that, we have these amazing podcasts that do the same thing, bring together people with different perspectives, live classes for uh, middle and high school and college students that are all online, all modeled on this RBG Scalia model of civil dialogue among people of different constitutional perspectives. End of plug, except check it out at constitutioncenter.org. It's free and it's just this amazing shining beacon of light for civil dialogue and, and constitutional learning. And it's when, when we started, it was inspired by the example that she and Justice Scalia set. I'm going to ask you one last question with the uh, sort of little precatory warning to our um, friends here that we may go a minute or two over past um, our deadline and that we know that suffering through Zoom is not fun for any of us. But I have to ask the question because it keeps popping up in the chat, Jeff, and that is we've talked so much about Justice Scalia, the um, jurist, Justice Scalia, the feminist, Justice Scalia, the ACLU uh, uh, pathbreaker. We haven't talked at all about how deeply weird it is that I've got, you know, a mug and I was showing you before, I've got the candle, um, I've got the pillowcase, I've got the descent earrings. Um, Jeff, how did she think about the just mayhem of, and there's a bunch of questions about the Saturday Night Live hagiography. What did she think about the utter absurdity of the world fetishizing and falling in love with and having t-shirts and tote bags of RBG. Did it surprise her? Did she love it? Did it freak her out? Um, what Talk about this nexus between this tiny little woman who really thought she was just writing in some sense in obscurity and the phenomenon that we started this conversation talking about. Uh, absolutely. I have my bobblehead behind me and more swag, of course, throughout the house. Um, 
she carried her own RBG swag when we were at Glimmerglass. She she carried RBG tote bags. You know, uh, you can't spell truth without Ruth. She loved it, all of that. Um, and she got a kick out of the memes. Of course, famously, her clerks had to tell her who the notorious B.I.G. was. But when people from around the country would send her uh, icons and folk art, and when we were at Glimmerglass, the stage hands, these brilliant women had made this huge mural of her, a folk art mural. She uh, saw it with, with great pleasure. But what's so striking about it is it didn't go to her head. It wasn't an ego-based thing. Oh, isn't it cool that I'm on tote bags? Like everything, I think she used her celebrity mindfully to advance the causes she believed in. She understood that it was extraordinary that she was an icon to so many women, and in particular, young women, who, as she noted, just thought it was striking that here's this tiny, you know, octogenarian woman, as she put it, who's such a boss. You know, she's breaking the stereotype. She's not acting the way women her age were supposed to act. And she thought that projecting this powerful image, the uh, RBG workout and the boxing and and the um, memes would increase the power of her dissenting voice. But the reason, and this is the note I want to end on, the I think it was the last thing she ever wrote. Um, she sent to us at the National Constitution Center, we gave her the Liberty Medal the day before she died. It was the day before the high holidays. The video was broadcast, but she was working with us until the end to make this amazing tribute possible. And you could you check it out, friends, online. It's it's free at the Constitution Center website. Um, we assembled some of her favorite uh, special friends, including uh, J-Lo and Kate McKinnon and her favorite opera singers who sang the most achingly beautiful arias to her, which you will not be able to watch without being incredibly moved. And she wrote, a, she was not able to... Um, deliver a speech, although she wanted to, but she she gave us a letter. And in that letter, which I not, don't have right here, so I'm not going to quote it in her perfect words, but it was essentially, she said, I had the good fortune to be alive and a lawyer at a time when other brilliant women had laid the stepping stones for women's equality. And she noted Pauli Murray and others. And then she said a version of, I was someone who used whatever talent she had and gave all that was in me to make the world a little better. It, it was a note in the end of great humility, quiet strength, collaboration, courage, and, and shining virtue of, of, of just, uh, she, she was exotic. She, it wasn't about her. It was about, it was about a much bigger cause, which was the cause of, liberty and equality and justice in America. So that's why she became an icon. And that's why, Dahlia, you and I were so privileged to know her. And that's why she inspires millions of people every day. Thank you, friends. Thanks for learning about her. Um, uh, Dahlia, thank you always for these conversations. I can't wait to read your book and to learn from it. And thanks to our hosts for convening us. And I think we're going to bring Erica back for one yes. last question. Thank you, Dahlia and Jeffrey. I mean, the comments, I don't know how many you've been following, but what a treat to be able to have learned from you um, and for you to share so many stories of friendship um, with us tonight. It was really, really special. Thank you all for joining us. Um, hope you'll join us again soon. And we look forward to hosting you, Dahlia and Jeffrey, in person once, uh, once we're able to do that again. So everyone, please stay safe and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. Bye.